two cities, one West Jerusalem, which is the Israeli, became the Israeli city, and East Jerusalem is the Arab city. Now, West Jerusalem had many, many, many Arabs in 48, and they were thrown out of their homes, and all their homes was taken by the Israelis, and they were given to politicians, governors, army, prime minister, and this is one of them. Ben-Gurion had an Arab house, and Golda Meir had an Arab house. Now, in 67, when the Israelis occupied the rest of Jerusalem, the people, the owners of this house, found themselves in the same city, with an open city. They could see their house, but meanwhile, there is an Israeli family living in that house. So I have taken four characters in this book, myself, my mother-in-law, and the first architect in Palestine called Andoni Baramki. He happened to be his son, Gabi happened to be my neighbor. Now, Andoni had built many, many, many buildings in Palestine, many houses, and he built one house for himself, and he called it actually Nur Ayuni, the light of my eyes. It was his favorite building. And 48, the Israelis occupy the house, and they leave the house, because there was a lot of shooting, and he ends up taking only his orange cake and a knife. That's all they take from the house. And they leave to, 40, to 48, they leave to Ramallah, they become refugees like ourselves. And in 67, when the borders are gone, he goes back to see his house. And actually, in the 19 years when his house was in Israel, he used to go every Saturday to the roof of the house and look at his house when the Israeli soldiers are not there. And when I write the story, the reader would think that he's really in love with a woman on the other side. The way I describe her curves, her colors, her uh, you know, movements and everything. The reader finds out it's a building. And in 67, that when Andoni goes to get his house, he finds that in the house lives a squatter. He goes to court, to Israeli court, and everybody was skeptical about him going to an Israeli court. He wins the case, and when he goes to take his house, the judge tells him, yes, Mr. Andoni. This is what I was going to read. Ah, okay, go ahead. Andoni. It's a long passage. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not prepared for this because I was expecting her to read. But, <laughs> but you will be a good, better job. Well, Mr. Baramki, I wish it were that simple, but unfortunately, it is not. It is not that simple. It is true that you have won the case for evicting the Jewish squatter from your house, but that does not automatically mean you can move there to live in it, just like that. Uh, Mr. Barabki, I must compliment you on all the interesting documents, photos and drawings that you have kept of your house for all these years. And now the house keys, but I am afraid there is an important small detail that you seem to have missed. You are an absentee. The judge declared. Absentee, Andoni looked questioningly. Yes, the judge said, as far as the law is concerned, you are an absentee. You are an absentee landlord, and consequently, your house is absentee property. Realizing the absurdity of what he was, had just said, the judge avoided looking at Andoni. Absent? How can I be absent? And Doni kept repeating, an absentee, the judge corrected him. An absentee, how can I be an absentee when I'm standing right in front of you, Your Honor? Well, I'm sure Mr. Ronan knows very well, as far as Israeli law is concerned, you are an absentee landlord. But, sir, in this case, in my case, as you can very well see, neither I nor the house from which you have evicted the squatter are absent. 
Mr. Baramki, I understand your frustration, but as I explained to you and to your lawyer, as far as Israeli law is concerned, you are an absentee landlord and hence your house is absentee property. There is nothing I can do about this fact. And it goes on like that. So, so what happens? Yeah. And, uh, uh, what happens? Then it says, then it says, Realizing that historical facts do not resonate with Israeli judges and only shifted to logic and common sense. Your Honor, why is it that when it comes to paying taxes to the Israeli government, you do not consider us absentees? But when it comes to getting our property back, then we are considered absentees. No one ever told me you're an absentee, hence you should not pay the tax. The judge had almost dozed off. Well, because he was used to all this. Well, Mr. Barabki, I'm afraid that is the law. Which law? What law, sir? Israeli law, of course. If Israeli law rules that I'm an absentee when I'm standing right in front of your honor, then what does your honor say about that? I, of course, follow the law, replied the judge. And who made this law, sir? The government. Sir, do you see a human being in front of you? Or do you only hear the voice of a ghost? Do you think I'm blind, the judge fired back? Case dismissed. Yeah, I, I just want to shed some light on this. As far as the Israeli laws, now you have almost seven or eight million Palestinians in, this, in, the, in the world. You have one and a half million in 1948, Israel kicked out 90% of the population to create the state of Israel. So the Israelis found themselves with many empty houses, with many empty farms and what have you. So what they have done, as I mentioned before, they have taken the houses and considered them absentee property because the owners of those houses are not there, 90%. But the 10% that existed in Israel, they moved them. If you were in Jaffa, they took you and put you in Haifa. If you were in Haifa, they took you and put you. They demolished 420 villages between the year 48 and 52. So all of those who were in villages, they took them and put them in a city. So they shoveled the population, which meant that you are absent also, as far as your property. So if they take you from, you have a house in Jaffa, and they take you in Nazareth, your house. So everybody became absent when it came to property. Now in 67, as I explained to you, the Palestinians were present again because they occupied all of Palestine. For example, Gaza is 75% of the population who live in Gaza came from Israel proper. The West Bank, you have almost one and a half million. So all of these people, Andoni, myself, and many refugees, are, we are not absent anymore. We are there. We are in Israel, in the occupied territories under Israel, but these are uh, legal statuses. It's not that something I invented for the book. So we are all absent when it comes to our property. So I could go to my father's house in front of me, but if I want it, I am absent. But I am not absent when it comes to paying Israeli taxes. We are very much present when they occupy us, when they continue to take our land. But if that house is for sale, and Israeli can go buy it, I cannot go and buy my own house because I am absent. Does that continue today? Absolutely, today. I mean, the book was written yesterday. Right, right, right. <laughs> yes, welcome, welcome. And another passage. At the ticket counter. How many tickets? One, inquired the young woman sitting behind the counter. Tickets, Gabby exclaimed. Yes, tickets. Tickets, Gabby repeated. Yes, sir, ticket, she smiled, Gabby then said. Son of Andoni. Yeah. Senior ticket? Senior, Gabby's face broke into a broad smile. Perhaps too senior, exceedingly senior. 
come on, for God's sake, hurry up, buy the bloody ticket and move on, complained a young voice behind him. For a fraction of a second, Gabby looked back, then turned and gazed at the ticket woman for long moments. Did you say I should buy a ticket? Yes, sir, this is not a free museum. You must buy a ticket. I do not understand the problem. Must indeed, and how much is the ticket? Gabby seemed to ponder this. 30 shekels, regular, 25 for seniors. 30 shekels, regular, 25 for seniors, Gabby repeated. The ticket woman lost her temper. What is the matter with you, sir? Today the museum's opening, and as you can see, we have tons of visitors waiting in line. Yes, yes, of course. What is the matter with me? Gabby responded, his smile slowly turning into hysterical laughter. Ha, 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 ha. For fuck's sake, something is seriously wrong with this man. Would someone get him out of the queue? How much longer are we expected to wait? The complaints from the line started getting louder and louder. You want me to pay 30 shekels to enter? Ha, 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 ha. The Ha, 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 my father and Doni, ha, 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 ha. No one could, around him could figure out what he was trying to say. I do not understand what is going on here, sir. The ticket clerk made one last attempt. Then his obscure words were transformed into nervous howls. He chuckled and laughed, then bent over clutching his stomach. Then someone said, I think he's saying this is his family's house. Well, this is the photo of the uh, house, of Andoni's house, that we've been talking about. And the Israelis had the guts. Of course, he lost the case. They wouldn't give it to him because he was absent, absentee. And what have they done of it? If you go to Jerusalem today, they call it the Museum of Tolerance and Coexistence. <laughs> so the story goes like this. They know actually who is the owner of this house. It's not that they don't know. They have written a letter to Gabby asking him to join on the board of this museum. They have guts. He writes back, and he says, and also they never call it the Baramki. They have given it a Turjman uh, name, which sounds uh, Jewish, even though it's not, but they have chosen it before. So he says, I am willing to join if you correct the history. If you write, this is my father's house, this is my house, and if all the information in that museum tells the story of the house, I will join. But I am not in denial of what happened on this land as you are. And actually, this book is dedicated to Gabi Baramki, who, is, who used to be the president of Birzeit University, who was my boss. So Gabi has always told the story so many times, and that's why I have decided to uh, dedicate the book for him. Now, in this book, I have chosen four characters for a simple reason. Losing a home, as many of you know, really is a very, very deep psychological loss. I always tell people I may look normal to you, but believe me, I am not. And the Palestinians have had this trauma of losing their land, of their home, their carpet, their book. Their, my mother-in-law was always upset because she never brought with her the presents that her friends gave her on her wedding. Gabi Raramki was always sad because in 48, his family never brought him his photographs. He could never prove that he was living in this house. So people really were very sad. A friend of mine who was a musician was very sad for the loss of the piano. And I think we Palestinians have not talking about our personal losses. We were always talking about the collective loss. We lost Palestine. But like all nations and all people who go through trauma, it takes you a number of years to be able to tell that story. And it's not easy to tell that story. 
So in this book, there you have four characters. Myself, who I have decided I cannot face this kind of emotions of going to my father's house because my father went to his house and he was very saddened by the experience of not allowing him go into his house. And he came, he was very sick and I was very young and I could not handle the emotions of seeing my father in that state. So I decided I'm not going to visit my father's house in Jaffa even though it is half hour away from where I live. Baram Ki, being an architect and educated man, decided he's going to go through the legal ways in Israel trying to get his house. He did not succeed to get it. And there is another main character in the book called Huda. Huda is a friend of mine. She's younger than myself. And Huda, for his father, take her right after 67. She was a little kid, five years old. And he was very proud. He wanted to show the, his kids and his wife the house. So when the city was open after the war, he takes the whole family there. And he's apprehensive a little bit with five kids from a distance. He's explaining to the family, look how beautiful the house is. Look at the upper floor. This is my bedroom. This is my mom's bedroom. This used to be the salon. And eventually he gets the carriage to cross the road and entered his garden with five kids and the wife and his mother who was crying because this is the house where she had lived. And all of a sudden, the door opens and there is an aggressive woman comes out with a little dog also, an aggressive little dog that starts barking. So here you have a woman saying, the woman automatically knows that this is the Palestinian Arab family and this is their home. She doesn't even ask. And she says, if you don't leave right away, I'm going to call the police for you. And he says, call the police for not. what? I am just bringing my kids to show them to the house. And she says, I'm going to call the police. Get out of here. Get out of here. He gets a little bit embarrassed in front of his kids, so he decides to cut it short. And he turns, he takes the kids, and he starts walking away. Meanwhile, Huda sees that her father was crying. And that leaves a very strong feeling in her, in which she decides, if my father could not go into his house, nobody's going to live in peace in this house. This promise was made in 67 when Huda was five years old. Now Huda is almost 50 and she goes to that house every Saturday, every other Saturday. And when the house was renovated, she went in, she took the tiles, she took the doors, she took the windows and moved them all. She said, this is my father's house and actually she got physically <laughs> into a fight with the Israeli owner. Now, every Saturday I went with her, every Saturday she goes to the house, she opens the garden, she walks into the garden. If there is a lemon, she picks it. If there is a pomegranate, she picks it. If there is an almond, she takes it. Meanwhile, the Israeli owner inside calls the police. The police comes, the police knows Huda. Huda knows the police, the owner knows Huda. The three of them act, <laughs> really, it's like a crazy play that is acted every Saturday or every other Saturday. <laughs> everybody knows everybody. So the police comes, they take Huda, they put her in the police. Meanwhile, you know, in the car they talk to her because they know her. They throw, an <laughs> they throw her in prison for one night. She sleeps there and next day she goes to the jury. The jury knows her. <laughs> so he says, Huda, would you stop bothering this Israeli family? Would you stop giving them hard time? And listen, Huda, if you, do, if you keep doing that, I'm going to deport you one day. And she looks at him and she says, but, jury, judge, if your father has planted a tree, wouldn't you go and pick up the fruits of that tree? Tell me, where am I wrong? He looks at her and says, go, because really there isn't anything. But these acts continue. And if you come tomorrow to Palestine, to Jerusalem, she takes sometimes loads of bus, a whole bus, stops next in front of her house, and you come, and if you Google Huda Imam, she has a website, and she has, 
She has trips to West Jerusalem, and the names are the most amazing. The first one, the biggest robbery in history. Come and see the biggest robbery in history. Come and see my father's house, and so it goes. So, Saad, Emery, thank you so much for these wonderful stories, which are funny, but are so tragic. Let's give her a hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, the books are outside. When people say, how, do you, how, how can we support Palestine? I say, buy the book. <laughs> uh, I have just one question, and I'd like, I'm sure you all, but as a member of the audience, I'm asking one question, um, which is this very poignant, very, very poignant image that you sent for the invite. This very, I don't know whether you'll notice it, it's one of the most unreal images you can see where you see a young bridal couple trying to cross the border. And it's this bridal, this bride in her finery and the groom. And then you see this awful reality of the crossings, of the border crossing there. Um, I, I would like you to talk, just explain that particular image a little. Uh, you know, really, what happens, the image, as you all saw, is a wedding. Now, people on East Jerusalem, you have to realize Jerusalem, or what had become East Jerusalem, is the biggest city in Palestine, in occupied Palestine. It almost have a quarter of a million Arabs living in it. And we are destroyed.